Professor Binder, thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with your background? Where did you start? What's been the arc of your career so far? And where are you now? Uh, sure. Uh, so I grew up in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, I spent many, many years there. I went to college there. Uh, I needed to find a major when I was in college. And we used to say uh, everybody majored in history if you didn't know what to major in. So I majored in uh, history. Uh, learned a bit about, mostly about the United States, American history, 19th century mostly. Uh, graduated, needed a job, come to Washington, because that's, that's what you do with a history major who didn't really have a plan. Somehow I ended up uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, I ended up uh, working for Congressman Lee Hamilton uh, from Southern, uh, Southern Indiana. I started there in 1986. So I was there uh, 86 through 90. Uh, I used to remind uh, Lee, although he wasn't too pleased with the reminder, uh, that I was born uh, just a week or two after he was first elected in 1964. And so he'd been there a very long time. He was probably among the most respected of members. Um, I got a sort of warped view of Congress because of uh, so hard working uh, person uh, and knowledgeable and expert expert uh, and just uh, absorbed information. So I could have spent uh, my career on Capitol Hill, but I decided uh, I really was actually pretty interested uh, in Congress. So I went off to grad school in Minnesota, uh, uh, ended up writing a dissertation about congressional rules and their evolution, ended up in Washington, first at the Brookings Institution, uh, and then wanting a tenure home uh, in an academic department, I ended up also uh, going to GW and somehow uh, 25 plus years later, uh, I have a home or a foot in both uh, in both GW, uh, Public Science and Brookings. So uh, that's, uh, that's me in a nutshell. You know, we uh, talked to uh, Larry Evans earlier on the on the program, and I think Lee Hamilton was one of yep. his big uh, influences <laughs> as well. So Lee Hamilton reaches through the through the whole scholarship at this point, I guess. He, he does. Every year he took on uh, an American Political Science Association, an APSA congressional fellow. Uh, so I was first meeting fellows in the 1980s, long before I went <laughs> to grad school and even knew uh, what the APSA was. Uh, but it was emblematic of uh, Lee's uh, kind of like looking and pulling for expertise in places that he wasn't uh, an expert in. So. Well, great. Well, why don't you talk a little bit, just broadly speaking, what are your kind of high level interests? Uh, and then we'll dig more deeper into Congress. But generally speaking, what is it that, you, you know, captures your attention when it comes to, I guess, political systems, more generally speaking? Um, so I'm a student of institutions, uh, obviously of political institutions. Uh, I'm most interested in where they come from. Uh, both uh, as organizations, as sets of rules uh, from congressional mandates and so forth. Uh, where do they come from? How do they evolve? Why do they evolve? Why are some parts of institutions easy to change? Why do others parts linger on right long after the coalition uh, that put them into place when the coalition is gone? And then harder to do, uh, but why or in what ways or under what conditions do institutions and rules matter? Uh, for whom do they matter? How do we know they matter? Do they affect um, behavior? Do they affect policy outcomes? gridlock, uh, and so forth. So why don't we um, talk more specifically then about Congress? Um, and I, I know one of your books is about majorities and minorities, right? Uh, majority, minority rights, majority rule, I think is the, is the title. Um, and, you know, maybe we can start off the conversation there, you know, and, and I'd like to come at it from a perspective of, of someone thinking through the members of Congress and, and thinking all of them should have well, why not? Why don't they all exactly have the same power? And how can there be majority, uh, you know, rights or minority rights? Aren't there just rights? So it's a great way to think about uh, what we think of as the House and Senate, at least in terms of the formal rules. Right? There's a whole world of informal rules or norms we can come to. But in terms of the formal rules of the game, if you bury your head into the House Rules Manual, which is really fat, and the Senate Rules Manual is like a pamphlet for reasons we could come to. Um, if you bury yourself into the rules, what you'll find is an awful lot of the rules are really about what you asked about. 
individual rights? What are the protections for individuals? What are the parliamentary um, advantages that are afforded or protected uh, for individuals? Even when you look at notions of like what the opposition gets or what majorities get, it is very rare that the rules specify something about party. Right. So, and which is a, a, a surprise to me when I first began and began digging in, into the rule book to try to sort out individual rights, coalition rights, and party rights. So, first, there are relatively few specifically explicitly partisan rights. Um, we can come to the other question about why are there majorities, right? Why do coalitions get advantages? Um, in, in over over individuals, we'll come to that one in a moment. In terms of uh, majorities versus majority parties, the real issue here is the rules get written in 1789, but obviously, you know, Congress isn't frozen, and so as parties emerge first in Congress and then by the 1830s, 1840s, right, once you get electoral parties outside the institution the pressures on Congress to, and lawmakers to use the rules in different ways, that is how we begin to emerge to see party rights, what looks like party rights, even though the rule, the, technically the rules are not empowering the majority party. So again, it's this issue that rules in one context empower certain groups, rules as that context change, even though the rules don't change, have different uh, effects on who's given procedural rights in, in the chamber. Yeah, and now I mean, the harder question is uh, at the root of your question is like, why are there advantages given to groups over individuals in the first place? And I think some of that is a process of learning over time, but it's also a process certainly as we see it clearly in the house, as parties emerge outside the institution, there's a battle to take advantage of the rules to one to who's, who's ever in the majority party. Now, if lawmakers cared about the future, they probably would not empower majorities, right? Quite so clearly, certainly as we see in the House, right? Because you might think, well, I'm going to be in the minority. I should be protecting individual rights and I should be empowering who's in the majority. But lawmakers, not today and not then, back in the 19th century, they think about the here and now, right? They think about what their party can achieve and what rules do they need to get there? So over time, the right the dynamic sometimes we call it path dependent, right? A choice is made, go down one branch, and the once you go down branch with a particular rule that empowers you to make additional rules, you end up with really powerful majorities that tends to serve the interests of the, the party that's making the rules. So I think that's probably why, although individual rights remain why it's easy for me to step back and write a book about uh, about the rights and the rules uh, that empower majorities. So what are these kinds of rules, norms, uh, you know, habits, if you will, whatever it is, what are the kinds of, um, I guess, institutional systems that are in place that give the majority some extra power or give the minority some extra power uh, you know, in any context, either on the floor or in committee or what have you? So at least in terms of sort of the, the formal angle, and then we come back, I think it's uh, important to think about why it might be similar or different in terms of these informal norms or, or practices or behaviors, at least in terms of the formal roles. And, and with the caveat, political scientists, we all <laughs> disagree. <laughs> My view uh, from looking at the evolution of these rules, uh, the one rule that certainly makes a tremendous difference, and we can see it by looking at the historical path that the House takes in the historical, very different historical path the Senate takes, even though they start really from the same rule book. A core rule here, a consequential rule, is what we call in the House today the previous question motion, right, which is just a fancy way of a majority looking out or anyone looking out of the chamber and asking, are we ready to take a vote? The House version of that today allows a simple majority to cut off debate. And of course, once the House gets that rule and interprets it in a way that advantages majorities in the early 19th century, well, then they can use that rule to cut off debate by simple majority on other rules that empower the majority party. So that over the course of House history, and certainly over the 19th century, you end up with an enormous set of powers given to the majority party 
largely in, in my account because they have uh, weaponized might be too strong, but they've honed, if not weaponized, the previous question motion to cut off debate on rules that further empower themselves. Senate, for a set of historical reasons, drops its version of the previous question motion. They hadn't used it yet. The House hadn't figured it out yet, early, early uh, 19th century. And sure enough, once it's gone, they're fine for a little while till partisanship heats up, till sexual debates over slavery hooked up and then leaders look in the rule book basically and say, uh-oh, they can see what majorities are doing in the other chamber. The other chamber has a previous question motion to cut off debate. The Senate lacks that, that rule, which means every time they try to put one into the rule book, uh, i.e. to ban filibusters, somebody filibusters the motion, right, to create a rule to ban filibusters. And, and that takes its own, again, quasi path dependent pass, right? The heart, it's technically, as we know now, we, it's technically possible to cut off debate, what we call the nuclear option. Uh, but if you're following the rules, it's politically difficult to do that. So that rule leaves the Senate today um, basically at the whims of individuals and at the minority of, of large, large minority coalitions. In the House, right, we can see speakers exploit the rules to the majority's advantage. So uh, the previous question seems to be the key one for the House uh, and the lack, the lack of that issue in the Senate uh, determines the nature. Both of these are floor related uh, rules, right? What about in terms of the committees? You know, it's, you look at the committees and, you know, there's different resources for the majority minority party, um, which, you know, I, I think is kind of hard to justify if you look at, you know, the original formation of Congress, you know, how did that, how did those kinds of advantages for the majority crop up? And also in terms of the rules of the committees themselves? Well, it, to some degree, I mean, we have, we do have periods, and, and maybe this is the sort of instructive way to think about it. We, we do have periods of commercial history with pretty strong congressional committees, that is committees having resources, committees having procedural advantages on the floor, um, deference to committees, so informal uh, power afforded them by their colleagues. But we never get strong committees like that and strong parties at the same time. So in periods of congressional history where the parties are ideologically diverse and thus don't want to empower their leaders, or for other reasons, we might have a weak need uh, or one weak need party. In those periods, you see strong, strong committees. But um, once you, you go into periods with strong parties, we tend to see more centralized decision making. And that is a move to draw resources away from committees, or even if they have resources, like there's a deference to leaders on the part of committee chairs because their agendas are set by leaders. And of course, committee chairs would defer to leaders if they thought leaders weren't acting in their own in committee chairs' interests. So again, the, the, the rise and the reshaping and emergence of political parties, it reshapes the institutions, who has advantages, who has perhaps power, uh, and thus, and we think sort of the policy outcomes that emerge from that. What about in terms of the coalitions you mentioned earlier? So non-party groups, uh, either in the House or the Senate, you know, I think we had some previous guests uh, talk about, um, you know, either the caucuses or, you know, the rise of certain, you know, the blue dogs or, you know, there, there are different groups that have come up that are not necessarily party aligned, but, and, and presumably they don't have any you know, rule advantages, but still can get things done. What's, what's in, how do you treat those in your framework? Right. Well, well, a couple, a couple ways. First, uh, we, we do see uh, factions as we usually uh, call them over House and over Senate history. Um, I think sometimes it's helpful to distinguish between those that are, if, if let's say I'm in the Republican party, those are on the moderate, the left side of the Republican party and those on the far on the far right and ditto for on the, on the Democratic side. So these centrist factions, um, they can make a difference really by finding common common cause, either with a minority party in their own chamber, or uh, and that's probably the easiest way to, to think about it, right? Because they're sort of closest. A, a moderate Democrat 30 years ago might be quite close to the most liberal Republican. So those types of non 
partisan caucuses can make a difference by, by basically challenging the leadership of their own party and using it with the heft that comes from having votes from across the aisle. So, and we do see periods of time where that emerges, certainly 1970s, uh, probably the, the latest time, a little bit in the 80s. Uh, but as the parties have kind of sorted themselves into liberal and conservative camps, there really isn't anyone left in the middle for those types of caucuses. Um, we see it a little bit in the Senate, they call themselves gangs uh, that might emerge on an issue and, and basically put pressure on the leadership uh, to build a bipartisan coalition. We see factions on the far left and the far right. Uh, those are uh, lead to different types of dynamics that we saw with the Freedom Caucus uh, under House Republican majorities, almost really taking that leadership hostage for demands that often the leadership couldn't meet, uh, which often left to basically sort of walking into a canyon and uh, leaving leaving the party there. So uh, it's hard for those extremist parties in a system that prioritizes large bipartisan supermajorities to work, to overcome vetoes, to overcome filibusters. It's hard for those outside factions uh, to do much besides block, but that's often what their what their goal is. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, some kind of coalition can only gain extra power uh, if it's able to kind of co-opt some of those majority party inf institutions or infrastructure. Uh, otherwise, they're no, no they're no better off than they would be as indiv as individuals. Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no constitutional and there's no necessary reason why these majorities are have always been partisan majorities, right? We could imagine a world where there are regional majorities or competing regional majorities, but that hasn't happened, right? The most, as I think of it, the most, the most common coalition, the most common winning coalition is based on party. And so that just feeds itself over time. If you want advantages within the institution, you typically do it through, through the party in some way. Um, unless you're part of a, a, a successful faction, although, you know, party leaders and parties have resources, they can raise money for you, they have a lot of carrots, sticks not so much, but but a lot of carrots, and that just reaffirms and fuels, so long as the parties are working in their members, in their interests, that just fuels the power of party as, as the most common winning coalition, which really, really starves the oxygen. Uh, out of potential rival coalitions. So uh, I'm curious your perspective then on this concept of you know two parties. Um, you know you would think that uh, I mean I guess it stands to reason that if the parties are able to put some kind of rules or institutions in Congress that reinforce their control, that that's going to lock out other parties from emerging. Um, is that your perspective on why there aren't more parties or are there other reasons that you think are the, are the core drivers? So I think it, I think that's an important part of it, but it's buttressed by an American political system, an American party system, and a set of legal rules that also advantage the two major parties. So, I mean, at a most narrow uh, level, right, if you think about getting onto the ballot in a state, right, the majority party in the minority party Typically, right, if you have 5% of the vote, you get automatic ballot access. Well, one of the major parties is not going to slip below 5%. So you're automatically on. You're on the third party or the Green Party or running as an independent. You can have a pretty high threshold uh, of getting signatures and the legwork needed to get on the ballot. And that's written into state law, right? The part, the two parties are advantaged in state law. So that's one element, but also just think, right, how do you win the presidency? Right? You need to win a majority of the electoral college vote. It, it, it doesn't matter if you are a regionally strong party, unless you can form a majority from across the electoral college, well, then your party's not going to go anywhere. And you're not going to attract more people into your party because, you know, politicians are ambitious and they're rational. They want to go where they can win. And if the deck is stacked in the interests of the two major parties, it's really, really hard to break through that in any sustained way that would allow you to win the presidency and all the resources uh, that, that come with that. What, if we go back to committees for a second, um, you know, within the committees, you know, we've talked about uh, the rule system inside committees, you know, what, you know, the committees have this role of gatekeeper um, and how does that play out when it comes to majority or minority 
kind of privilege, if you will, and having that chairmanship versus, you know, a, you know, 50, you know, 49% of the members on the committee? Oh, uh, well, I guess first a, a, a caveat, uh, because legislative scholars debate everything, we also debate whether committees, in fact, are gatekeepers, in that if, if the the median, if the middle person, usually in the majority party, but if the middle person in the floor, in the chamber, were upset that a bill was being bottled up by a committee or a committee chair, there are mechanisms in the rules for forcing those issues onto the floor. And, and we do see it over time, right? Issues that the majority party through its committees doesn't want to legislate on. Um, immigration reform, uh, a central one over the last decade, uh, before that campaign finance reform over two decades ago. Now, maybe those are exceptions that prove the rule that committees gatekeep, but it's also a sign that committees and parties are, uh, they, they know where their butter is, <laughs> where their bread is buttered. Uh, they are probably more responsive to currents within their party, at least, um, than, uh, than meets the eye. So um, I think it's a, a little hard to say that committees have extraordinary powers today. Uh, they have some procedural rights, uh, but if there's a threat that they would lose uh, control of an issue, that's often sufficient, typically sufficient, to generate an issue and push it on onto the pull it out of committee. All right. Well, let's move on to then the the Senate a little bit. Um, you've done a lot of work on the Senate, and you know maybe we can start it off just as a comparison on this majority minority issue on the size. You know, for the, the to me the key difference is the number of of members, right? And um, you know, you know, there's this uh, Dunbar number, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, where, you know, a person can only maintain relationships with so many other people that you max out uh, and you can't remember their names. You don't know their, you don't know their marital status or how many kids they have. And that, I think the Dunbar number is around 105 or something like that. And so the Senate's right on that edge where everybody can know everybody else. Um, the House is way over that number and that would require specialization. It requires a uh, a new, new kind of organization. Uh, so I'm wondering how that, that, that concept of number of members is important in the organization of the body and of this majority minority split and the way they treat each other. Um, is it driven primarily, do you think, by just the number of members or is it something more, something different? Are there other factors driving them? So, I mean, uh on the one hand, you could imagine a, an account of the Senate today and its evolution and its resistance to the types of party empowering rules that we see on the House side. And we can read that as the, a, a body, as you said, that their personal relationships or social relationships that are constraining the interest in accumulating, allowing others to accumulate power as opposed to keeping it spread out across members. The, the caveat about thinking about the Senate that way is that the rules of the game, in fact, really do empower individual senators in ways that they can use to block coalitions from their, even from their own party. And so, and at the same time, there are all these partisan pressures within the majority party that have over time chipped away at those individual and minority rights, right? And so I, when I step back and look at the Senate, despite the closeness of many of those relationships, I see the Senate as like this long, slow, sometimes fast, slow, uh, I don't know, it's this punctuated equilibrium, right? We, something happens, we resolve it, something happens, right? Long march towards majority rule, right? It's not like they go the other way around, right? Uh, one senator a couple of years ago said, look, you know, um, once you sque squeeze the toothpaste, right, out of the tube, it's really hard to get it back in. And so I would be hesitant to say that the Senate has really resisted the type of accumulation of parliamentary rights, although certainly they're far more widespread today um, than they are, are for sure in the House. So you think it's just a matter of time 
before the Senate becomes the House? Um, a matter of time, yes. Although if if I had to put a number on it, I, <laughs> I couldn't. Um, I, I do think there, and, and I guess this is another sort of a, a, an issue for, or a challenge for political scientists who try to understand the institution, uh, which it is very, well, it, it's hard for us to truly, what's the fairest way to put it? One way to put it is that we really discount the importance of individuals, right? In part, because we can't get, get to them. And so it's harder for us to observe what these social relations are doing uh, in terms of uh, how they affect the distribution of power and what, what the Senate is doing. But there's no doubt that these relationships matter, right? You, you can see it, well, you can certainly see it when we see successful episodes of deal-making, right? Where a, a chair and a ranking member they have worked together so long, they know what the other side wants in a deal. And most congressional deals aren't zero sum, right? They don't usually divide up a pie, say we get three pieces, you get two. It's more like let's enlarge the pie, right? You, you get a peach pie, I'll get an apple pie, and we'll call it omnibus pie, right? And But you can't make those types of deals the other side wants. And when we talk about these Senate gangs, I, I think that part of what it is that's part of what they're capturing is they know each other enough, they can tolerate each other enough, and they know what the other side wants, or at least are willing to listen to what the other side wants. And those types of deals, we have them historically in the House, but we don't have them very much today because there's absolutely almost right no crossing, uh, crossing the partisan aisle there. So can you talk a little bit more about the Senate and how it works? I mean, you already mentioned the filibuster a little bit, but if you can go through your, your perspective on the Senate, where it is, how it evolved, the, the role of the parliamentarian, for instance, I know you've done some work on. Can you talk through that a little bit and what's important to, to really know about the Senate and how it evolved? Um, so again, with the caveat that uh, legislative scholars uh, disagree about the dynamics that have generated today's Senate. Um, I do put an awful lot of stake into uh, the disbanding of the previous question motion. And I think it's also just important technically to understand why that matters so much today, right? If, if you are a leader and you want to put a, a bill or a procedural motion on the floor, and obviously you want to have a vote on it, you're, that leader has two options. He or she can say, I ask unanimous consent to vote on this bill, on this motion that's going to put a bill on the floor. Unanimous consent, right? 100 senators, every single one of them has to agree. And if you disagree, if you want to object, you don't even have to go to the floor. You just tell your leader, you're on your side, hey, when they ask for consent, um, I'd like you to object on my behalf. And that's all systematized. Right. In my days on the Hill, a phone call went out from the bat phone. Uh, today, there's an email. Right. It, we're going to try to get this onto the floor. So one option is you need unanimous consent. Well, uh, that's almost I mean, that's it's absurd right? that all 100 senators have to agree on whether or not to hold a vote. Right. And not on final passage, just on whether we should put a bill on the floor. And if you can't get unanimous consent, well, then we go through this rigor role that we call cloture. In today's version of cloture, you need 60 votes. And what do we know about Senate majority parties over the last several decades? If we chart their size, right, they're getting smaller and smaller. And so we live in a world in the Senate where parties are smaller, majority parties are smaller, the rules stuck at 60, the parties are increasingly at odds with one each, each other for strategic reasons, if not ideological reasons. And so nothing gets good done. You can't get unanimous consent and you can't get to 60. So that to me, right, in the absence of a majority cloture motion, except in circ some circumstances, it, it paralyzes the Senate and it gives rise to hostage taking. It gives rise to, I would call legislative terrorism, right? Taking in one would think important things like can the government you know, issue enough debt to cover its obligations? shutting down the government, it, it's, it's not a healthy body, it's not a healthy institution. And the difficulties of figuring how the Senate's going to figure its way out of these holes, um, let alone 
think about how to solving problems, right? These are just like the extreme cases, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we know there are major problems in the United States. We know the parties disagree about how to solve them, but the rules of the game here really stymie the ability of parties to figure out uh, to come to come to any agreement. So if 60 is the number, I mean, it could be 51, it could be 60, it could be 75, you would still think there should be, you know, trading mechanism for them to get over that number, right? It's like you said about the pies, right? You know, is the majority just not giving the minority enough of their pie to get over um, that amount? Or is, or is there some other, some other kind of issue at play here where the minority is going to, you know, shoot it down no matter how, what kind of pie they're off? So I, I think the issue here, you have to be willing to go both parties or coalitions, whatever the pivotal groups are, both or more have to be willing to go to the bargaining table in the first place. And so if your leader or your party thinks like, like what are the costs if I just say no? Like what, how bad could things be? How bad is the status quo? Or what if we just keep on living with the status quo? Well, oftentimes, especially in a world of such intense partisanship where the battle for partisan advantage, just so you can gain control, it's so intense that we often answer, leaders will often answer that question. What are the costs of saying no? Hmm, not so bad. In fact, my party, my base outside Congress, in fact, might reward me for refusing to go to the bargaining table. So I, I think that's part of the issue here. It's, it's not just they can't get to the requisite size, that they can't actually execute a deal, is that oftentimes one party or the other doesn't actually want a deal and think they're better off, if not a, no worse off, right? Not going to the negotiating table in the first place. And that's how you obviously get the status quo becomes, you know, can fester. Uh, and of course, sometimes when you do nothing, things improve, right? If you don't, if you index something to inflation and you do nothing, well, you know, you're not worse off, <laughs> probably. Uh, if you don't index up inflation like minimum wage and suddenly minimum wage is uh, going down over time, well, then you might make a case that you're worse off by failing, to, by allowing this uh, policy just to drift, uh, drift on its own. So in your mind, the, this concept of, you know, the 60, uh, is that the key stumbling block to a more functional Senate or is it some other issue? So, so I think it's pretty core stumbling block. And, and the, issue, the issue really is, is to, to be clear, it's not because I think the Senate is strictly not getting to particular sets of policy outcomes. The problem is you can't vote. Right. If, if, if you can't vote because you can't get to 60, then what is the legislature doing and, and how do you hold it accountable other than to realize that they're not they're not even casting votes now forced to go online to cast a vote. Well, granted, sometimes they'll still be opponents to an issue, but other times putting something on the floor in fact, might be broadly popular and the cost of voting against it for a lawmaker might be quite steep. And lawmakers like to vote for popular things at the end of the day, right? They don't so wanna be on the So you're against side. the 60 to bring it to the floor, but not against the 60 for the actual vote? No, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, against, I, I'm against a high threshold for allowing a vote on anything, if that, if that makes sense. Right. Even if you want to call up a measure on the floor, you need 60 for that procedural motion. Well, that seems nuts to me right? in a in a legislature where at a representative legislature where we're sending people to act on our behalf. Typically, a vote in a large organization is 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 how you get to there. Right. It's, it's too large just to sort of have a individual discussion consensus, right? What we think of as kind of participatory democracy. We, we live in a, the Senate is adversary in democracy, right? You have to vote in order to register preferences to know where people stand. And that to me is the is, is the downside. It's a pernicious downside of a filibuster is you never get to the vote. So it sounds like, for instance, if you had, uh, let's just say a co-sponsor threshold of 50, right? You get 50 co-sponsors on a bill, automatically goes to the floor. 
automatically gets voted on. Um, now the question then becomes, that would solve, I guess, most of the problems you're talking about. Now, now the issue here comes into the ultimate minority right, right here, which is the filibuster. Now the filibuster can be conceived of as a, as a veto, um, you know, or it can, and I'm talking about an individual senator here rather than a group of senators, right? But an individual senator could have a veto on a legislation. You could set up a system that way, or you could give them five minutes to filibuster, and that would cause a certain amount of pain to everybody, or you could give them two days worth to talk through. So when you think through just that question on the single senator's so-called, you know, I wouldn't call it a minority right. I'll just call it a right to talk. Right? Where do you come down on that question? If, 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 the pre, if, the, if this idea of getting it to the floor were solved, if the idea of voting on it were solved in a majority, except you have this, you know, would you give an individual senator a veto right? Or would you give them a right for one minute to talk? Or where in between would you fall for uh, individual senators' rights? So uh, I'm all in favor of, there are lots of gradations or iterations or versions of filibuster reform, right? Some of it is time-based. Let's give them a day. Let's give them a week. Let's give two weeks. I don't have terrible uh, problems with changing the ways in which the we get to a vote, right? So long as eventually, if a majority is in favor of voting, I believe there should be a vote. I mean, another way to do it is say, well, you start at 60 and after three days you go to 57 and then you go to 54 and 51. Now, you know, maybe you just say, well, that's just reductionist. We know it's going to 51. So everybody's strategy is just keyed to 51. But part of the argument on that of, of senators and others who favor keeping the filibuster is that the opposition or individuals should be able to make their case to try to change minds. Well, if that's the case, then fine. I'll give you <laughs> I'll give you two weeks. Um, but oftentimes the goal is is veto power, not an exchange for hold, not even just holding something hostage, but just blocking all together. Well, if you can make the case and convince enough people to vote something down, all, all, all the power to you. I don't really see uh, the the I don't in, in a in the world we're in today where the rules are used to take things hostage and veto for good, and it doesn't generate negotiations that typically yield bipartisan agreements. If that's really a rarity, well, that's obviously not just the fault of the rules, right? It's a function of the nature of the parties. Um, but I think the, the day is kind of eclipsed in which the Senate can afford not to solve, not to ever take votes because it doesn't really address any of these issues. So it sounds like you're against individual member veto, but you're for them giving the chance to talk. You just don't know what period of time that is, whether it's five minutes or five days. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if I thought there was a chance that <laughs> that the current Senate would actually get off the dime uh, and make more changes, I think a little bit more about it. But I think generally, like if you think in terms of how the the rules today basically have these built in, in essence, forty eight hour windows. I'd be fine, like starting at 60, two days, 67, two days, right? So you could imagine a series where you're at a two week mark. Uh, I don't, I mean, some issues Congress might want to act faster, but uh, if the if the point is to hear out alternative voices, I'd go for a two week rule. And what about this concept of this parallel track? Um, you know, the the whole concept of the floor in my mind is this serial step-by-step -step process, right? You, you, you can't break it into multiple streams. And yet that's what they've done, I think, for this filibuster in a way. Um, what are your thoughts on that process? You know, should you put it back into a single stream and then that's really creating costs for the minority or the majority? What are your thoughts there? So, I mean, you put your finger on it, uh, any change, but especially that change of not allowing, like letting the pressure off and moving on to a second track imposes costs. And I think the issue here is that majorities, it really imposes more costs probably on the majority, right? Because it's their agenda. If they have a lot in a world of larger agendas and so forth, it's more of their agenda uh, that gets caught uh, in the vise there. Um, minorities, but you might find that minorities, when you, know, when you hold their feet to the fire, will they fold? 
we don't we don't have a lot of contemporary ep episodes where when majorities have tried to hold the minorities feet to the fire well they just don't <laughs> they wear boots and they don't mind the heat right and majorities typically give up because there are other things on on their agenda so yeah c conceptually uh, a single track uh, in conceptually uh might help uh but i think in practice probably there'd be such pressure to move on to the second track that majorities would simply abandon uh, the first one. All right, well, I'd like to move on to a, another subject, which is, you know, a little bit of work you did around uh, the study of uh, of those who study Congress. Uh, you know, it's a, you know, this concept of um, studying Congress as a scholar, right? And, and just the, we've talked to a lot of scholars, obviously, on this program. So I'm curious about when you've looked at scholarship on Congress over time, what are the, what have you seen? How has it evolved? And what are the any particular issues that um, are making the scholarship more interesting or less interesting? You know, what, what what comes up in your mind as where this whole kind of group of people is moving? Well, so I think what's sort of um, almost astonishing to me is how how long it took well, well with the caveat the political science itself is i don't know if it's young right it's a it's just over 100 <laughs> 100 uh years old it, it took quite a long time at least into the probably early 1980s at the beginnings of it into the 90s before you get sort of serious undertaking of looking at congressional development that there wasn't really perhaps at its origins uh well in the early 1900s, it was it was history, right? There's a sort of the origins were in the nature of these institutions, um, but that's not where the field goes for all sorts of reasons. So the study of congressional history, uh, not because we're his historians, uh, although there are lots of reasons one might study congressional history. One is just data, right? <laughs> Uh, we don't have a lot of very, we have a single Congress unless you study the states. Uh, and so if you want variation, you need to go back in time. So that's right. one reason you might study history. Um, others is just more if you're a comparativist, right? And so we want to, you know, have multiple time periods in which to make judgments about the day or to test theory in different areas. Uh, but the other reason to study history is because we're actually interested in the evolution of decision-making rules uh, and the conditions under which uh, they foster the types of outcomes that they foster and what does it take to change uh change institutions that's a relatively recent phenomenon for uh for legislative scholars and for political scientists um where's it going I, I think we we certainly know a lot more today about the historical evolution of the house uh and the senate and congress writ large uh than we did 20 20 30 years ago uh i think it it runs into uh, in any profession you like there are what we think of as well a little pejorative right methodological fads right uh their methodological uh approaches that uh, gain uh credence and others that fall by the wayside and we know it because we see uh, the types of methods that get your research published and so forth well for students of congressional history today or congress as a political institution the the challenge is what in political scientists and economists call causal inference like how do we design studies in order to really nail down whether or not something matters causally, as opposed to just right a correlation? I changed the rules, and we got a certain different set of outcomes, which might not be because because of the rules, right? In fact, we might change the rules because of the types of things that lead to those outcomes. So the challenge today is how do how do you how do folks who want to learn study and explain congressional evolution and institutions how do you meet the moment for showing causality and that's a hard thing with history right the the political prize today in political science is for field experiments uh it's for randomized control studies quasi experiments quasi natural experiments that's really hard historically um and for the obvious reasons we can't go into the lab and we right we can't uh, give dose we can't design studies uh, for things that have already happened. There are very clever ways to look for those types of uh, relationships, but at the end of the day, right, that looking for causality, it's, it's, it's very helpful for looking at the effects of an intervention. X happened, did Y happened and Y. But it's not so useful for explaining 
sort of on the other side, like why do things evolve, right? What are the dynamics that are put in place that yield particular outcomes? That's I think is quite different than what's the independent effect of, right, of redistricting on electoral outcomes, right? As opposed to where did the process of redistricting come from in the first place and why does it take the form that it does today? Those types of questions are really not amenable, I think, to our modern techniques of causal inference. So there's a challenge there uh, for folks who study institutions, study them historically, um, but there seems to be uh, still a fair amount of interest uh, across uh, across legislative scholars for kind of figuring out uh, how we got here and how it might be different. Well, it's interesting, you know, in a lot of the political science work, at least that I've read, there's a there's several different strands. It seems one is, you know, more institutional as you're discussing. The other is, you know, the the hero version of history where it's basically just a list of speakers and what they did and how they changed the rules. And so the speaker seems to be the key or a few people seem to be the key drivers of change in Congress. That's another, uh, you know, another strand that I've seen. Um, and then there's this, you know, more quantitative uh, piece that you're talking about where, you know, we're, we're looking for correlations and which of those might be causations. Right. And, um, you know, in particular when it comes to individual votes on individual things, uh, where you track the votes of a, of, a, of a member, you know, is their vote being caused or is it, you know, by, by some element is very difficult to untangle, I would assume. And uh, I mean, and maybe it's never clear cut even to the, even to the member. Um, so that's a, a key challenge, I assume, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the field. Well, for sure. And I mean, it comes up certainly in the questions, the sort of a core question about what difference does money make? What difference do PACs make? What difference do lobbyists make? Right. Do members do things or do lawmakers do things, i.e. vote certain ways that they would not in the absence of those prods? And uh, oftentimes it turns out for the most high tech of those studies that the that the arrow often goes in the other direction, which is that members get rewarded, for instance, by lobbyists or PACs for taking certain votes. That is, the money follows the votes rather than the other way around, that the money causes the votes. Um, but, and we, we can distinguish that in a statistical sense, but it's a little hard uh, in the world really to know, right, chicken and egg, like what exactly, right? certain members get elected from certain places where constituencies may favor on gun rights and so forth, attracts money. Um, is it really the case that it's rewarding? Is, is someone anticipating, right? Is someone rationally anticipating being rewarded? Those, those are messy uh, for sure and in, in, in certainly hard to sort out. But certainly the, the party seems to be a causative agent in the decision-making, right? He, yeah, and and I I think the the question is it's typically at it's typically at the at the margins at least right that it's hard to distinguish us if we think that partisans share a certain set of policy views then how do we know if, whether it's they identify with the party or they had their arm twisted right but it's often the case it's a little more sophisticated than that 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 party leaders structure the 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 choices that you have right. Party leaders are pretty good at taking certain options off the table so that you can't vote on them. So there's certainly party effects here. Uh, and again, obviously subject to uh, debate amongst, <laughs> amongst legislative scholars um, for decades. So I guess I'd like to talk about one other area with you um, on your Congress work, which is before we get into our other questions, which is around uh, oversight. Now you've done a whole book on the Fed uh, and Congress. Um, I'd like to get your opinion on oversight. We've talked to others on the, on, the, on the program whose oversight is typically more oriented towards investigations um, and that type of oversight, which is uh, very interesting, very necessary. But then there's this other view, you know, more like board of directors overseeing a, um, an agency and, and is it operating effectively? There's that kind of oversight. And then there's something else uh, maybe that you're getting at with the Fed. So can you talk through, you know, your perspective on oversight, particularly of these rulemaking agencies? Uh, 
Sure. So I guess the caveat is the Fed is a really weird uh, beast, uh, even though if we lined up you know, 200 plus independent agencies, right, we could put it on a line of other independent agencies, FDA, SEC, right, and, and so forth. So I don't want to say it's like a beast, an alien uh descended from Mars, but it is quite unusual in that it's it's two main spheres of influence and power, right? Monetary policy, roughly financial stability in the setting of interest rates and so forth, um, versus regulatory power, supervising banks, writing, implementing Dodd-Frank, uh, how much capital should banks hold and, and so forth. There's a presumption of that, well, put aside that the book argues that the independence is a myth. <laughs> but on the monetary policy side, policymakers and lawmakers will claim that monetary policy is carved away, carved out, that lawmakers don't have direct oversight over monetary policy. Maybe, maybe not. On the regulatory side, there isn't any uh, pretense of independence on the part of the Fed or lawmakers, right? Lawmakers freely legislate in the area of uh, banking, uh, certainly, right? Dodd-Frank is the most uh, visible recent example, or the CARES Act, right? The ways in which it directed uh, what uh, financial institutions should be doing. So what does oversight look like there? Well, in some ways, it's like oversight of other bodies, which is that Congress doesn't always really have a lot of incentives uh, to put the effort and the resources into figuring out what, what is going on in the agencies. Often, as we say, oftentimes it takes outsiders to pull it alarm to generate that interest. Um, but there are always interested uh, lawmakers who with the expertise often, not a lot of them, who follow these issues carefully. So uh, a Senator Warren uh, on the Senate side on financial regulation, uh, a Pat Toomey uh, on the other side of the ideological bench on, on, uh, on the Fed and regulation. Um, so, but by and large, I think there is, right, agencies end up with a very long leash Right. And lawmakers tend not to pay attention when things are going well. And that's certainly the case with the Fed. And when things go south, lawmakers show up, uh, they blame the Fed. And oftentimes they just turn around and give the Fed more responsibility. Right? The wake of the financial crisis, I think, was pretty clear to many, many people that the Fed had failed on uh, financial stability and watching with the lending practices of banks. What was the solution? Well, we gave more power. We made them the 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 system the supervisor of very large, systematically important uh, financial institutions, even though they just failed. Right? What's going on there? Right? That's lawmakers. Right? They can't figure out a solution. They don't want to own the solution, so they give more power to the institution, and then they'll knowingly just try to hold them, blame them, <laughs> the next time they fail. So. I don't know how widespread that is outside the Fed, but that's certainly the dynamic that you see when we're thinking about oversight uh, on uh, on the Fed side. And so, what do you think the appropriate, act, you know, oversight activities should be for Congress in, you know, in relation to the Fed or any other agency? Should they be, should they take it all back and do it themselves? Should they? you know, watch, have meetings once a week to review what they're doing and look at their operations? Should it be more like a quarterly meeting and monthly meeting? What would be your, after studying this, right, what would you say a, a better way would be for Congress to oversee the Fed or other agencies? So, I mean, one solution that Congress uses, um, someone in the Fed and someone in other, in, uh, other uh, regulatory agencies is really to delegate oversight, right, through, for instance, uh, inspector generals, right? And, and granted, yes, the at least the Board of Governors has an inspector general. I don't know about the rest of the, the, the reserve banks, right? So one way is to delegate uh, with, with more kind of uh, clause, uh, a little more powerful um, investigators who go, in, go into the agencies. Uh, and I think that model, to the extent that these IGs have some independence, some, they can be fired, um, some independence, maybe you bolster the nature of the IGs so that it's harder, uh, harder to fire them without cause. I think that's one solution. I, I don't think you ex exhort, I mean, short of exhorting members and, you know, getting members elected who care more about it, which seems uh, unlikely. And the other way, uh, it probably is to impose more transparency rules on the agencies um, themselves um, so that 
so that at least uh, others outside the institution who might care more can grab that information to make it easier to monitor what, what the agencies are, are doing. Now, uh, it's possible that the lack of oversight reflects that sometimes these agencies are working well. So it would be, a, you don't wanna go uh, overboard here and one size might not fit all, but I think at least in terms of the Fed, the greater transparency uh, and perhaps muscling up uh, IGs uh, might uh, in fact make, make a difference for, for other, if not agencies, if not the Fed. And, and the point of that oversight that you're mentioning, whether it's the, um, you know, whether it's through transparency, which is basically outsourcing it to special interests in the public, uh, or whether it's, you know, through, you know, the these individuals who are, you know, looking for more, it sounds more like an auditing function than it does really, you know, let's see how our policies are working out going through this agency. Is it achieving its mission? Is there high turnover in the agency? Are people satisfied with the with the day-to-day -day operations of the agency? I mean, these would be things that, you know, if it were a business and I were on the board, I would want to know these things, right? You know, is this thing doing its job? Is it, is it, is it doing so efficiently? Could it do so the same thing with less resources? Is it falling short here or there? Whereas a lot of what seems to be talked about as oversight is more like identifying a scandal or you know, really more exciting kinds of things rather than this mundane kind of business as usual, is it achieving its original objectives? So what do you think about that version of oversight and how that should be accomplished? Well, I mean, uh, it, it, we sort of call this distinction with, between in public science terms, right, uh, right, police patrols versus fire alarms. And so the question is like, what do the police patrols look like? And is it possible to delegate those police patrols in, into the agencies themselves? So, and I do think some inspector generals uh, are doing more sort of cop on the beat, uh, but I think you're right that mostly mostly it's a response to crisis. Um, the GAO, uh, that is a in essence a legislative uh, organization, uh, short staffed for sure. One one possibility is to restaff it, right? Make find ways to see that it can do that. To sort of cop on the beat, uh, and, and typically that's in the form Congress passes statute and includes includes around a range of like GAO studies, um, often because they couldn't agree on uh, whether or not a, a legislative change was a statutory change was necessary. So um, I do think there this the, the ways in which either through GAO or through IGs beefing them up could potentially produce that type of cop on the beat study. Um, and that's in the absence of uh, Congress or chambers that have are willing to put resources into doing it themselves. But of course, lawmakers, right, we live in a polarized world where the lawmakers don't really agree, and they certainly don't always agree on how statutes should be implemented, uh, how regulations should be written. Uh, and so treating Congress as this unitary actor with a single set of preferences, that that's often a non-starting point <laughs> as well. And so Right. The real, I think the question is, how do you do that type of continuous watchfulness if the people doing the watching <laughs> or who hire the watchers, the agents disagree on what they should be looking for? And I, I think that that's even more uh, more complicated. Yeah, it just depends on whether there is that core set of shared values and what the agency is doing. And the more that erodes, the harder that that job will be. For sure. So, all right, well, I think it's time for us to move on to the common questions I ask all of our guests, if you're ready to, to move on to the, the lightning round. Sure. Um, so the first question here is actually quite related to everything we've discussed, which is, you know, or underlies it. So what do you think congressional representation should mean? Well, uh, I, I guess you mean, uh, I, I always, I'm not even sure. There's there's so many ways to think about it. Um, I, I actually typically have in mind sort of a, a, a substantive representation. I, I think uh, demographics, I think, are important, sort of a descriptive representation. It would be good if Congress looked like America. I think that I think that's something to be worked on, uh, to be improved. Um, but I also think there's some world of uh, representation that um, we, the, the members who are lawmakers who are sent have some sense of conflicting views and values uh, that they uh, that that they're called on to represent. 
Um, so not purely policy, not purely descriptive. Um, I guess I'd like an ideal mix of, <laughs> um, of, of both. So uh, maybe I can get at it uh, a little bit through the, I think what you're describing here is the beliefs, there, there's the beliefs and judgments, right? And, uh, you know, does a member represent the beliefs of his district or, or her district, or are they making judgments based upon what their best interests are? I guess that's one fundamental way to look at the question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the end, because some districts or states will find a commonality of interests and often more likely you get a conflicting beliefs and values. The question is for representation to happen, do, do, do voters trust, right? Do they trust the member? Do they give them some leeway on some issues? Do they rein them in on other issues? Uh, and I, ideally a lawmaker can, can figure out what are the interests, what are the most intensely held interests, what are the ones in which he or she uh, needs to hew more closely to voices that they hear back home, and what are those on which law, uh, voters will trust them, uh, as you said, to sort of uh, substitute judgment. So it sounds um, like you believe in a mix, some belief, rep, you know, some belief style and some judgment somewhere the, where the yeah. member has to judge. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, inevitably we have elections in, in theory, if they were more <laughs> competitive, in order to let that experiment play out, right? <laughs> so lawmakers would know whether they've strayed too far towards judgment or, or uh, closer reflection of, of views back, back home. And, and the views that you're talking about, um, you know, when someone's elected, uh, you, I mean, are you talking about they represent, you know, that primary group? Or do they represent the the party who the voters who elected them, or do they represent the whole district? Uh, everyone in there. What is your you know perspective? This is a personal question, by the way. It's not an empirical <laughs> one. Um, well, uh, I think the. I just think it's hard. I, I don't think you're going to find a one one size fits all there. I just think it, it would almost be impossible to have somebody that we're thinking about sort of the geographic uh, set of voters or, or non-voters. Uh, I just think it's uh, all would be almost impossible, both because of voter indifference, uh, citizen indifference on a lot of issues. Obviously, many don't have well-formed policy views because they're complex and don't have the information or interest and figure them out, uh, conflicting sets of values. Um, I think it's almost impossible to think that they're going to represent the geographic area. Um, so uh, some are shy of that, perhaps their reelection constituency, like those, uh, those views that are necessary. Uh, and when you meet them, perhaps that gets you, keeps, is what helps explain why, why you keep that job. All right, so the next question is, um, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? And by that, I mean, DC versus the district, um, you know, the legislation versus oversight, how much time for campaigning, you know, these kinds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, I really don't think, I, I think the ideal type is the one where problems are being solved, where I have a, right, that I'm, I don't think there's much problem uh, that, that citizens and district residents' interests aren't being addressed when they raise them, right? You might think, well, that, that requiring more people in the district. I, I think lawmakers are pretty good about servicing their districts. Um, they don't, obviously, there are biases in how they serve districts, but I, I would say generally there's, they understand and get uh, and, and value district servicing. I, I don't think there's enough uh, resources, expertise, attention to solving problems, whether they are current problems or whether they are prob long-term problems, especially where lawmakers seem to have no electoral interest in thinking about the future. Um, I think if there's a if if there were to be a way <laughs> to harness members' attention and to plow resources into thinking about long-term problems, I think that to me uh, would be closer to an ideal Congress. So this problem element you mentioned seems to be like it has to be done in Washington. So if we, because uh, that's where they have to talk to each other and work on the floor and in committee. So would you, how much time would you put them in DC versus home? Are you, are you okay with the Tuesday to Thursday? Or do you like the two week on, one week off, the three week on, one week off? Where do you come down on that? So uh, conceptually, the for a while the senate had we may still have a three week on one week off certainly the tuesday thursday club uh the house norm seems like an awful short amount of time 
to get to know your fellow lawmakers in a way that would help you to try to legislate because you because you don't know who they are, you can't figure out what, what to give them uh, when you're giving out and designing those pieces of uh, pieces of pie. So more time in Washington for sure. Um, you know, especially with Zoom, these lawmakers can find a way to speak to voters. I think without actually having to be uh, present there. And do you have an opinion on the legislation versus oversight, or do you see that as sort of one continuum? Um, I don't have a strong view. I think we know that oversight is under underproduced, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean more of everything, but you know can't have more of everything. So uh, I, I just think in, in I would put the resources uh, in into these legislative uh, problem solving. Uh, more policy focused people, fewer communications focused people on uh, more people into commercial research service, into GAO and so forth. Uh, and, and some of that is going to spill over into oversight um, for sure. I mean, that, because that inherently becomes part of the uh, authorization process or reauthorization process, how whether or not laws are working, right? So it's both legislating and it's oversight. I'm a little less inclined to divide them up strictly. All right. Well, next question is, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? So this is going to sound like uh, pretty anti-democratic, uh, but I think there's too much in the, in the public. Uh, I actually see the value of closing the doors more often, at least at the initial part of trying to form solutions, right? So, I mean, there are ample examples, some examples uh, of late where gangs uh, have gone behind closed doors, have negotiated agreements, and then not open the doors until, as we say, right, nothing's agreed to until everything's agreed to. In, in a world where party bases like will penalize you for giving something away, I think those like not opening the doors until you have some core agreement, I think that's really necessary. Otherwise, one party will say, look, the cost of me saying no, saying no here, there, there, there's not a lot of cost here. The cost of saying yes, that's going to cost me a lot. Close the door, and so everybody sees the final package. Assuming then that that final package is then you know, tested, perhaps in committee, but certainly on on the floor and subject to more more transparency. Um, that's obviously the reverse way, of, uh, at least in terms of sort of generationally, right? In the 1970s and 80s, moving towards more sunshine, uh, solving other problems. But I think having solve the problems of back rooms, uh, unrepresented back rooms, there's a way to design those closed spaces that are a bit more representative. And but, so again, uh, is that in committee or is that, you know, again, right now it's more the leaders, leaders offices, right? Uh, that's where there's no, let, let the least transparency. So that's where those things would naturally move. Should it be somewhere else? Should it be in committee? Should it be some other kind of forum? Um, so I, I'm not an absolutist on either way here. I, we do see some of these, these pairings and closed doors happens through committee leaders or committee chairs and ranking files. We see others more often, as you suggested, through uh, leadership organizations. It, again, it, it gets back to our, our sort of earlier discussion that you don't really see strong committees and strong parties at the same time. And so uh, I am happy enough that the, if, if the goal is generating a range of policy solutions, I would take it from a leadership or leadership group, or I take it from a committee group. And obviously, they have to stand right. They have they have to make it under current rules to pretty high supermajorities in the Senate. So I worry less about creating packages that are so biased um, by closing the doors, right, or by only letting leadership uh, do these negotiations. So if 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 they're good enough to stand the test of supermajority support, or in a future world majority support, then um, I'm indifferent whether it's in committee or uh, leadership offices. All right, well, next question is, uh, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Well, as we talked about, I, I think the cur curtailing of supermajority rules in the Senate, uh, granted, all reforms have unintended consequences. I can't tell you precisely what will happen uh, if you lower uh, if you lower the rules or carve out exceptions to the filibuster. Uh, but uh, I, I think compared to what you get today, might well be well be an improvement. Got it. Uh, next question is, uh, what book or article uh, most shaped your thinking with respect to this congressional reform ideas? Um, so 
1977 was a book Congress against itself uh, by uh, Davidson and Olzek, sort of two greats uh, from the uh, long past the 70s as well. What it did was to kind of examine this moment of reform uh, in Congress in, in the 70s, both early 70s, mid 70s, and again, failed episodes as well as successful episodes and thinking about the coalitions that make reform possible, what are the motivations for reformers, how do reformers build packages, how do they advantage multiple missions or multiple goals, um, both kind of broadly speaking, but also down the trenches. Uh, it was just a great, uh, great book for kind of setting forth the patterns for how do we think about reform? How do we think about the rules of the game? All right, well, the last question is really about your, your personal work. Where, where is it going in the future? Are you working on any new books, any new areas of research? What's coming uh, in the future for you? Uh, so I, I have some interest in thinking a little more carefully about norms, about unwritten rules, about practices, uh, about where, again, where they come from, what does it take to break them, what sustains them, uh why is norm observing uh seem to be breaking down not just in congress but sort of rule following generally is not really <laughs> a, a, a high priority so I, I and i'm interested in both in terms of uh, thinking about you know things like the senate parliamentarian like where does he or she get that power why is there deference when is there deference uh what difference does that advice coming from the parliamentarian? How does that sort of nonpartisan norm, like how does it survive in a really partisan institution? And then more broadly, I mean, even just the example of the Fed, right? The norm that we used to think there's a norm of hands off the Fed, but recent presidents have been, and old, old presidents were happy to intervene on in monetary policies, break that norm. Where did it come from in the first place uh, and what is its future? So. Um, I think uh, there's lots of room there for thinking about the conditions that like generate healthy institutions and uh, those uh, that bring them to their bring them to their knees. So uh, that's what I got on my plate. Great. Well, Professor Binder, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure and best of luck with uh, with that work. Great. Thank you so much for uh, having me in your series. This was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yep.